Okay, another verse that pre-tribulationists like to use to point out that the church won't be here for any part of the tribulation is 1 Thessalonians 5.9. For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, that whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. So comfort yourselves together and edify one another, even as also you do. They like to say, well, it's talking about the day of the Lord, and that's the context. But let us stay sober, putting on the armor of God. For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. So they say, well, see, we're not appointed to wrath. He's going to save us. My opinion and some other people's commentaries on this will say that I, it's contrasting. He's not appointed us to eternal wrath, but to obtain a, eternal salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. Because we have, what kind of salvation is it? It's eternal. It's after this earth. Okay, we're saved by grace. Um, we're saved now, but we're given eternal life, correct? We're not appointed to eternal wrath or hell. So that's what I see in this verse. If we go to the King James Version and the Concordance, it says, For God hath not appointed us to wrath, but to obtain salvation by our Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, so wrath here is... Um, properly desire... It's the Here's the origin, okay? And the use, it's a noun. And then here's the strong meaning, or the strong's meanings. Anger... The natural disposition, temper, character, so we're not appointed to his anger. Movement or agitation of the soul, impulse, desire, any violent emotion, but especially anger. So again, anger, anger, wrath, indignation, anger exhibited in punishment, hence used for punishment itself, like eternal punishment, hell of punishments inflicted by magistrates. So we're not appointed to his punishment or anger but to obtain salvation. And salvation in this passage is a noun. Deliverance, pr preservation, safety, salvation. Just like I shared with uh, Revelation 3.10 and how the word to, um, that he will keep us referred to safety or guarding or keeping his eye upon. So here... Salvation is deliverance, preservation, safety, salvation. So it could be safety or it could be eternal salvation. Deliverance from the molestation of enemies. Protection. <clears throat> In an ethical sense, that which concludes to the soul, safe, soul safety or salvation of messianic salvation, eternal life. Salvation is the present possession of all true Christians. Future salvation, the sum of benefits and blessings which the Christians redeemed from all earthly ills will enjoy after the visible return of Christ from heaven in the consummated and eternal kingdom of God. So, salvation. We're not appointed to his wrath or anger, but to obtain salvation. If you go to answersinrevelation.org, there's this commentary by Tim Warner on this verse. Okay, and he starts out saying many pre-tribulationists make Every attempt to point to paint a picture of the tribulation so horrible, no Christian could possibly survive it. The entire period is labeled the time of wrath. Then they introduce 1 Thessalonians 5.9, for God did not appoint us to wrath. Therefore, a pre-tribulation rapture must be implied. After all, Jesus would never allow his bride to be dragged through the mud before the wedding. So the reasoning goes, and they say, yeah, he does. he's not a wife beater. That's what a lot of people say. This sounds good to modern Christians who have never missed a meal or slept on the ground in, or been in prison or been beheaded or had family members beheaded for their faith. It seems only reasonable for believers who have, servi who have service agreements on all their appliances to be raptured before that awful time. That, you know, everything's all, you know, peaches and cream until they're with Jesus. But for the Thessal Thessalonian Christians who received this letter, life was not so easy. They were already being persecuted severely for their faith. Many had been killed, just like people are today, by ISIS. 
Paul was not telling them that they would not have to suffer. They were already suffering. To whom this letter was written, the first Thessalon, Thessalon, Thessalonica. Can't say the word. Okay. Um, so anyways, he goes on. And it says right here, The tribulation is not exclusively God's wrath. Some of the events are clearly the result of man's own behavior, especially like the second horseman of the apocalypse war, the red horseman. For example, are instigated by men. Much of the horror of the tribulation is the wrath of Satan. Christians have no promise of exemption from the wrath of Satan, trials or tribulations or fallen man, because John 16.33 says that we will have trials and tribulation, but be of good cheer because he's, he has overcome the world. So he gives us the strength to endure that or to be, and he's with us. No doubt the great tribulation will be dreadful. Jesus said there has never been anything like it before, nor will be anything like it again. But Revelation point, paints a picture of a large group of overcomers emerging from the hour of trial. Revelation 7, 14, and 12, 11, and 24. Certainly God's wrath will be unleashed during the tribulation on the followers of the Antichrist, just like it was on the Egyptians um, during when Moses was trying to, uh, when the Lord was using Moses to get his people to be free, um, and the plagues came upon the Egyptians, but they did not touch the Hebrews. But this wrath is specifically said to be selective, not universal. It says, see Revelation 9, 4, 16, 2, 16, 10, that it comes upon the unbelievers. Okay. Uh, God's wrath in the church age. Um, I didn't read through all of this. Let's see. Okay, God's people in the tribulation. The book of Revelation refers to the followers of Jesus Christ in the tribulation several times. So some people, some pre-tribulationists -tribula like to say that, well, the church is never mentioned after, you know, a certain point of scripture, after John mentions the seven churches. All rapture views place saints of God on the earth during God's wrath. Whether we call them Israel, the church, or tribulation saints is irrelevant. In Revelation 12, 10 through 12, in verse 11 here, and they overcame him by the blood of the lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they did not love their lives to the death. So they lived for the Lord, okay? And he tells all, even the church of Philadelphia in Revelation 3, he tells all seven churches in Revelation chapter 2 and 3 um, to endure till the end or to those who overcame Okay, um, let's see. It says, this person wrote, Who are these who overcame Satan by the blood of the Lamb, if not Christians? If a single child of God is on the earth at that time, all of the pre-tribulationist logic about 1 Thessalonians 5.9, demanding a pre-tribulation rapture to spare believers from wrath, is nullified. The only way to maintain this distinction is with an artificial, unbiblical distinction between us and them, and a haughty, elitist attitude that we are somehow superior to other saints of God who are chopped liver and are appointed unto wrath. Because that's what I was thinking the other day is, how can you say that only the faithful ones are going to be delivered from his wrath while the other six churches or other types of Christians are going to be left here? That is basically having pride, and pride comes before the fall. And if we're saved in Christ, it says that we're all one. That there's, there's none righteous, no, not one. We're only made righteous through him and by his grace and his salvation that we obtain by believing in him and repenting and giving our lives to him. So if we're all believers saved by grace, not by works, works only come because the Spirit works through us and he, he enables us to do those good works um, to grow the kingdom. But if we're not saved by works, then how can we say 
that some are going to be worthy of being raptured beforehand and some are not. It doesn't make sense. It's not logical. Um, let's see. God has routinely judged the wicked while supernaturally protecting his children at the same time. And I've mentioned this before in previous videos. The precedent set with the plagues of Egypt is important because it establishes God's normal method of judging the wicked. God protected his own people, the Hebrews, while pulverizing the Egyptians with a series of plagues identical to many of the plagues in Revelation. Water turning to blood, made bitter, um, the beasts of the earth, and so forth. Other examples could be cited, such as Noah and the flood and the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. Ezekiel 9 describes God's preservation of the righteous during Nebuchadnezzar's destruction of Jerusalem, also Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the fiery furnace, and how the Lord didn't deliver them from ever entering into that burning furnace, which caused the attendants that put them in there to die when the door opened. But he protected them through it, and he was even in there with them, as well as Daniel in the lion's den. God shut the mouths of the lion and kept lions and kept him safe supernaturally. God never raptured his people to avoid his wrath. He has supernaturally preserved them through it or given them the means to protect themselves, such as Noah's Ark, the early warning giving to Lot to, to escape, or the Passover when the angel of death came upon the Israelites and the Lord provided them a way to um, signify to the angel to pass over their house and keep them safe. He has even on occasion supernaturally preserved them from the wrath of the enemy, which I shared um, in Nehemiah chapter 4. We see that many times throughout the Old Testament when they're, when Israel is fighting an enemy and how the Lord supernaturally helped them win the victory. A case in point is the three Hebrews in the fire furnace. I already said that. So 1 Thessalonians 5.9 means exactly what it says, and God's past precedent proves it to be true. All without any rapture to heaven. The pre-tribulation argument from this passage is a circular argument and therefore illogical. So I wanted to share that. God bless.